Hey everyone, it's Brody with Everything Board Games. I had the opportunity to check out Glenmore 2 Chronicles on Tabletopia. Just to make sure that you all know, this is still all prototype art, and there will be some changes with the game, so don't base everything out on this review, but this will give you a great overview of what the game is about. In the game, you play as a clan leader in Scotland in the early medieval ages. You're looking in the game to expand your territory and to increase your wealth. You'll be creating pastures for cattle and sheep, growing barley for whiskey production, selling goods to different markets, and gaining control of special landmarks such as locks and castles. The game comes with eight different chronicles that you can consider as expansions for the game. Each chronicle adds rules and components to the game. They recommend playing with one to three of these at a time and are not played all together. In my preview of the game, we played with one of the eight chronicles. Alright, let's continue with the basic setup. Each player will choose a color and takes their home territory tile in that color. This tile is a double tile with a clan castle on the right side and a village on the left side with a river going through them both. Each player will take six coins, the clan markers, and Scots meeples that match their color. One of your Scots meeples will start on your village tile. Place both the clan board and the rondelle in the middle of the table. Place the different resources, the coins, and the victory points in the supply near the board. Place the landmark cards face up next to the board. Let's now set up the clan board and rondelle. Take one of each player's Scots meeples and randomly place one on the rondelle starting at any space and continue placing one for each player. If you are playing a two-player game, then place the white six-sided die in clockwise order ahead of the player pieces. Using the die is optional in a three or four player game. The die will shorten playing time and adds a little more unpredictability to the gameplay. Take the five S tiles and place them face up in front of the die if it's being used or in front of the Scots meeples. Shuffle all A tiles together and form a stack in indicated on the board. Do the same with the B, C, and D tiles. Now fill in the remaining spaces from the A stack in a clockwise direction, leaving one empty space behind the last Scots meeple. You'll place the David Hume tile that has an S on the back near the clan board. And lastly, you will place the tile that says the end roughly in the middle of stack D. Now be aware that playing the different chronicles can change setup, and changes will be listed in the section of that chronicle. So you will need to pick which chronicles you will be playing and change setup accordingly. The game is played in four rounds. The first round ends when the last tile of the A stack is placed on the rondelle. Second round ends when the last tile for the B stack is placed and the third tile ends when the last C tile is placed. There is a scoring phase that occurs when the last tile of each stack is placed. The fourth round ends when all players have moved on or over the the end tile, and final scoring will occur. The player whose Scots meeple is at the rear of the rondelle will be the first player to go, and turns will be determined by whoever is in the rear. So a player could take more than one turn in a row if he stays in the last position. If the die is used and in the last position, it will be rolled and moved forward that number of tiles shown. This will exclude spaces that other players are on or any chronicle tiles. Whichever tile the dice lands on will then be removed from the game. When it's your turn, you may advance your Scots Meeple to any space on the rondelle with a tile on it. You will take that tile and pay any resources listed on the top left. You will take that tile and you will then place it in your personal area. When placing a tile, you will need to obey some rules. The tile will need to be touching the edge of an already placed tile, and corners do not count. There must be a Scots Meeple on a tile adjacent to the new tile. This does include corners. So this tile can be placed orthogonal or diagonal. If the new tile has a river, you must place this on either side of your already formed river. And there can only be one river running through your territory. Remember, you need to obey all of the mentioned rules for placement. If you take a person tile, this tile will not be placed in your territory and is placed to the side. If the tile you have has this icon on the top right, this is an overbuild icon, which means that you have to place it on top of an already placed tile. If there are any Scots meeples or resources on the bottom tile, then you will simply move it to the top of the new tile. After placing the tile, you will take the one-time effect of whatever's on the bottom left corner. After this, you will now activate all neighboring tiles. For activation, diagonal and orthogonal both count, so you could at most activate eight other tiles. You can activate these in whatever order that you would like, and all benefits for activation are listed on the bottom right of each tile. Activating tiles will either let you gain resources, exchange resources for points or other type of things, move your Scots meeples around, or give you straight up victory points. It's important to know that there's a limit of three resources per tile. After activation, you will add one or more tiles from the current stack to the rondelle board. Make sure there's just one empty space behind the last player. 
At any time in the game, if all players passed over a tile without taking it, that tile will be removed from the game. Now when taking a person, which will have a gray background, you will place it off to the side of your player area and take a one-time effect of playing one of your clan markers on an empty space on the clan board. You may need to pay the cost indicated on the roads connecting to the chosen space. If any other player has already placed their marker on a space, then you can start at that location and only pay the money from the roads connecting that space to your chosen space. You will take your bonus and from now on no other player can reactivate that space. It would be a good idea before you start playing to go over all the bonuses listed on this board. When taking a landmark you will take the card that matches the landmark and you will get whatever bonus that landmark might give you. So make sure that you check out the bonuses on these cards as well. You will see in the middle of the rondelle is a market. At any time during a player's turn they can buy or sell resources at the market. To buy a resource, you will place the number of coins depicted on the leftmost space and take the resource from the supply. If coins have filled up all three of the spaces, you cannot buy any of this resource. Now you can only buy resources if you're going to use them immediately. For example, when you need to pay for a tile that you'd landed on, or when using the trade tiles. If you want to sell a resource, you can put it back into the supply and take the rightmost stack of coins. If there's no coins, for that resource on the board, then you cannot sell it. Now let's talk about scoring. Remember you will score in between rounds. You will compare your achievement areas from each other and calculate points accordingly. When calculating points, a player will earn the number of that achievement that they have over the player that has the least of that item. You will be scoring whiskey barrels, the number of Scots meeples on your clan castle tile. It's important to know that this doesn't mean any castle tile, but the castle tile that you start the game with. You will score points for the number of landmark cards, and lastly, the number of person tiles. You will follow this chart here to score points. So if you soar above one other player in any of these areas, then you can score some major points. At the end of the fourth round, final scoring will take place. You will get one point for each coin that you have, and you will compare your territory size. You'll count how many tiles that you have, and you will compare that to whoever has the smallest. Each player loses three points for each additional tile that you have compared to the player with the fewest. So big, huge territories get penalized. Some landmark cards will give you additional points at the end of the game, and some clan spaces on the clan board will also award you in-game points. The player with the most points wins the game. Now I don't want to ruin all the chronicles in the game for you, but I will mention the one that I got to play with, which is the boat race. So if you don't want to hear about this, you can skip ahead. Each chronicle roughly adds about 10 minutes of gameplay. All right, in the boat race, you will start with a boat at your home castle. The start tile for the race is placed roughly in the top third of the B tile stack. If playing with low numbers, you will add non-player rivers between players to make the river longer because you will be racing clockwise from your castle around the table back to your castle. In setup, you will take the reward tokens and place four face down on each player's castle and each non-player's castle as well. The race starts actually when a player crosses the start tile on the rondelle. A player can then use movement points, originally used to move their Scots meeples, to move their boat instead. From your castle, you will move clockwise to your leftmost river spot, and you will move onto the player who is on your left and go to their most right river tile. You will be moving around the table until you make it back to your home castle. Remember, as the game goes, players will be adding more river tiles onto their territories, making the river longer. The first player to make it back will win the race and be awarded 15 points and 1 whiskey. Second place gets 7 points, and third place gets 3 points. All other players receive the last place represented by a bottle of cod liver oil. Also, if you don't finish the race, you also get last and receive that cod liver oil. When you have that, that means that your coins will not be worth any points at the end of the game. When racing and you pass another player's castle with the rewards tokens on them, you can take a look at them and take one of your choice. This chronicle adds a lot to think about when forming a strategy. Now remember there are 8 chronicles in this game, so wow! So I've actually never played the first version of the game, although I've watched many videos of others playing it, but let me tell you what this version adds to the game. One thing that I can see that they focused on was creating more player interaction and you will see this enhanced with all the chronicles added. For example, the boat race, you're racing your boat down your river, down all other players' rivers around the board, back to yours. I mean, that's fun. It also adds some strategy. 
When I played, I was all about trying to get my boat back to get first place. I collected extra three victory points and some resources while passing other players' castles. And, well, all the other players got the leftovers, which was less desirable bonuses. Also, being the winner of the race, you get 15 points and a whiskey. Well, it just happened that I was going for the most whiskey. So, with this extra whiskey, it took me from having four, which was giving me five points during the scoring phase, to five whiskeys, which gives me eight points. Anyways, if you've played the first version, you know how awesome your choices can be for selecting the tile. You don't want to jump too far ahead because all the other players will go slower and take more tiles and activate more tiles. But if there's just a very desirable tile, you might want to jump forward to get it. I would say there are times where you need to jump and times where you need to stay back. But you will have to make those tough decisions when playing. As you can see, there are no roads in this version either. This makes it easier to place and activate tiles that you want to activate. Now the market is great and gives you a way to do actions you want to perform. And it will award the player who plans better. Remember, you can sell any resources if you can to the market near the end of the game to get money, which will be changed into points. So having a lot of resources is not a bad strategy. Now let me talk about those overbuild tiles. These at first seemed not so good for me. And for you, at certain times, they might not be good. But if played correctly, you can place this on top of another tile and activate eight other tiles surrounding it. And it can be very powerful if played right. I like how the clan board has those purple spaces on the outside and give you in-game points. Getting the clan token on one of those spaces that matches your strategy can boost your points at the end of the game. And what's this? There's a Brody space? Anyways, this game is amazing, and with me only knowing one of the eight Chronicles, I'm super excited to see what the others hold. Again, this is Glenmore 2 Chronicles by Funtales. Kickstarter will be coming soon, so if you like what you see, then go back it.